privilege to go to oh share to share my script. Sorry, Zuba was telling me something. Um, that recording is now in progress. It is, of course, now in progress. Um, but yeah, good morning, everyone. Another big welcome to our Sunday service here uh, in May. So appreciate Isaiah and Shari sharing the welcome and, and the prayer. And uh, it's just so encouraging, isn't it, to now be able to meet like this. You know, we, of course, we've got a long way to go before we're back to normality. But it is certainly an encouraging step towards that, you know. And, and I'm just so, so encouraged, so inspired. And I love the song, you know, How Great Is Our God, just like, I don't know, it always gets me that song uh, so, so powerful. But uh, yeah, I get the privilege to share some thoughts with you this all, uh, with the, all of you this morning from John chapter six. So if you'd like to be turning to John chapter six in your Bibles, that is where we'll be this morning. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, be able to, being able to look into the book of John and study out John chapter six in particular has been really, really encouraging. Uh, it's been inspiring. There's, there's honestly, there's so much in John chapter six. I'm going to tell you again, but later in the sermon, but please do go and study out John chapter six in your own time. There's only so much I can do in like 20, 30 minutes. Uh, and it, it's worthy of a lot more further study. I can tell you that for sure. But I'm so encouraged to be able to share a bit of John six, some of the things I see, hopefully some of the convictions I can pass on that I, I feel like I've learned and I will preach to myself today, by the way, and hopefully will, will help you too. I really think John chapter six is a pivotal and important chapter in John chapter six. You know, if you were with us last week, you would have heard Chris talking about Jesus healing uh, the man by the pool. Uh, and that was a fantastic sermon, having those life changing conversations. And it was a life changing conversation for the guy at the pool. Um, and in John chapter six, we see the beginning or we see one of these first phrases of Jesus. Right. Many of you will know these I am statements. OK. I can see in the screens, there's many people here that know their Bibles well. But if you don't know your Bible, I'm sure there's a good chance you've heard maybe one of these I am statements of Jesus, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the resurrection. Um, I'm the living water. I'm the, I'm the true vine. And so in John chapter 6, we, we see the very first I am statement of Jesus. And I hope that excites you that we can read this one today. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And so we'll be reading John chapter six in a little while. But the sermon title I, I've given today, which you may have already seen my fly I made, is you are what you eat. You are what you eat. And uh, hopefully it'll make a bit more sense as I share today just why I picked that title. You may already be quite intrigued as to as to what I'm talking about. But anyway, you are what you eat. And so, yeah, a little, little bit of context before we start reading John six. As I said there's so much in John six. Um, if you go and read it. Jesus feeds the 5,000 and another one of these stories I guess that if people don't really know the Bible and they don't know much about Jesus I, I, I reckon there's a good chance they know about Jesus feeding the 5,000 right um, you know the, the five loaves the two fish I'm dead sure they know about that one um, he's also what he's walked on water with his disciples um, doing a lot of his ministry around uh, Galilee the Sea of Galilee um, and he's now in this place called um, Capernaum, all right, uh, a town called Capernaum, and, and the people are like flocking to Jesus, people are, are flooding in to see him, you know, seeing these healings, seeing him feed the 5,000, and, and they just want to see more and more of Jesus, okay, and so by John chapter 6, where we're going to read, they've now found him, they've, cha they've like, chased after Jesus, we want to go find this guy, we need to go ask him some questions about who he is, okay, so we're going to read John chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 25. So if you want to get your Bibles or your iPads or your phones or whatever other device you now use to, to, to read the Bible. Amen. It's just the Bible, which is great. All right. John chapter six, verse 25. It says, when they, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me. Not because you saw the signs I performed, but, but you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of God, which the Son of Man, sorry, will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give? that we may see it and believe you. What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna 
in the wilderness, as, as, it, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who had given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father that gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Wow. Um, incredible passage of scripture here so much to discuss so much to delve into as i said at the start i can only touch the surface of john chapter six please do go and study it out a bit more in your own time but we see we see jesus here you know having these this this discussion with these people that have now found him and they want to know more about jesus they want to know more from him himself okay and and he comes they talk they talk about the, the manner uh, in Exodus that God had given through Moses to the people as they wandered through the wilderness. You guys may be familiar with that story. If you don't, you can study it in the book of Exodus. And uh, and they're asking him more and more about what does he provide? What, what does he come to do? And he talks about being, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of the life. I am the bread of life. And, and this is the key statement which we're going to focus in on here today. And it got me thinking a bit about bread, right? I reckon that you know we all have our favorites okay I'm, th- I'm talking about the physical bread now okay i've got i've got a few pieces of bread for you okay all right this this is just in our household just just today okay just just as of right now okay what, what have we got we've got some wholemeal wholemeal maybe some of you like your wholemeal brown bread um that's good you know healthy option maybe you like a good bagel yeah there you go some bagels there we're planning we're trying to do maybe a little barbecue later so we got you know we got some we got some free from bread you know so free from gluten, milk, eggs, that's, that's looking good. Corn, tortilla wraps, sorry guys, they're all finished. I can maybe get you some later. Um, we got, uh, we just got those standard gluten-free tortilla as well. We got, we got so much bread right now, okay? I don't know what it's like in your household. We have so much bread and we all have our favorites, right? We all have our favorite types of bread. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe you do like a good bagel or tortilla or your standard loaf. But the point is this, that, you know, it got me thinking about bread is so symbolic, right? In our culture, I reckon every culture in the world has a type of bread, you know, something. Um, it doesn't matter where you go. I looked at an A to Z of, of breads so studying the scriptures, studying out this chapter. And there's, there's so many different types of bread. And it was, you know, this idea of bread that, you know, Jesus is talking about, it's, it's just, it was just as symbolic back in his time as it is in ours today you know and they even go on to talk about about the bread and, and we have so many choices of bread now right we've got gluten-free bread low carb bread we've got all kinds of things you know we've got so many different variations now to meet all kinds of different nutritional needs i don't know if it was the same back then they probably had more basic style but we have so many choices and jesus uses this he uses this bread this this basic common ingredient to make a point about not the physical stuff but the spiritual word he provides and, and it's this only the bread that comes from him has an eternal impact and we all need it right no matter what type of bread you like this morning whatever your favorite what you don't like certain brands jesus in in the spiritual sense is the bread that we all need it's the, it's the one common thing between us all we all need the bread of life. We all need not the gluten-free, but the sin-free bread of life, okay, in our eternal senses, in our spiritual selves. Jesus goes on to explain that he is greater than Moses, that people point out to Moses, oh, but Moses gave us bread. What, what are you going to do? And he says, no, God gave you the bread through Moses. I'm greater than Moses. You can go and read that story in Exodus 16. It's incredible. Jesus says, I have the only bread that can satisfy 
your hearts. This is a significant statement, guys, he makes. This is, you know, this first I am statement. And maybe I've already made you a little bit hungry and started to think about what you're going to eat after, after this sermon, just by talking about food. But this is where the idea of, you know, you are what you eat comes from. And so this lends into my first point. All right, my first point. I've got three simple points for you this morning. Number one is more of a question. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? People flock to Jesus, right? They, they ran to him. They chased him down. They, they ran all the way around this, the Sea of Galilee to find him because they wanted to know more about him, right? For some, maybe they just wanted to be there to, to enjoy the, uh, the miracles, the, the feeding of 5,000 or the getting the physical healing, right, that he could provide. But they flocked to him and, and they came to him with questions. Who are you? Who are you? What are you going to do for us? How do we know you are from God? They wanted to know more about him. They wanted him to give them a definitive answer. Tell us who you say you are. And then Jesus uses a mic, I, I might call a mic drop moment. You guys seen that? When people just, you know, have one of these moments where they're like, they make a bold statement and then they just, they just leave the whole room stunned or something. You know, maybe TV shows or something, you've seen that. Jesus uses not just any phrase, but he says, I am the bread of life, okay? Now, anyone who is familiar with the Old Testament will be, you know, and, and many of you, you are here to the Jewish audience that was with him. This would have been like, bang, whoa, he said, I am. He said, he, he's using, he's echoing the phrase of God in Exodus chapter three, when God actually revealed himself to Moses, you know, I am who I am is who is what I, oh, I am that I am, God said to Moses. And this would have been like a, a, a big moment. I don't know if you guys have watched um, or any of you have watched uh, Prince of Egypt, 1998, the DreamWorks version. I love the scene where they depict Moses with, with God and revealing himself. And you can go watch that in your own time, but an amazing moment. And I think Jesus in many ways is revealing himself to the people that were, that were with him as well. And in saying this, I am the bread of life and I am you know, using, echoing that phrase, he's, Jesus is leaving no ambiguity, right? He's leaving nothing to chance. No, nothing, nothing's unclear to Jesus. He's very, very direct. I am the bread of life. I am greater than Moses. Jesus knew who he was, why he had come, and what his mission was all about. And that's kind of the main point. He's very definitive. He's very, very much straight down, down the line about who he was. And then it's, then it's up to us, or it was up to them to decide what they would do. You can note down this scripture. I'm not going to read it all with you this morning, but it's Matthew 16, 13 to 16. Um, it's a report where Jesus, he, he asked the disciples to go and uh, report out, scout the land. Who did the people say I am? Because of course, Jesus' word and teaching is now starting to, you know, go on and, and go ahead of him, if you like. And so something Jesus often did was send his disciples out to go and, you know, get reports. And the disciples report back to Jesus after one occasion about who people said he was. And they came back with a few answers. They said, uh, Jesus, people are calling you the new John the Baptist or someone like John the Baptist. They're saying you're like Jeremiah or Isaiah or one of the Old Testament prophets. And you think about these individuals, right, that they are comparing Jesus to. These are bold, radical, powerful individuals. Jeremiah, Isaiah. John the Baptist, he ate locusts. You are what you eat. He ate locusts and honey, you know. Come on, I don't know what that, you know, what that does for a person, but he ate those things. He was radical, radically different. And this is what they're saying Jesus is like. You remind us, Jesus, of, of these type of people. These are powerful people. These are people that stood out, you know. We think we can often think of Jesus today in different ways, you know, like, you know, yes, you can see the pictures, Jesus holding the lamb, you know holding the lamb and very like, you know, peaceful. And Jesus was of course, peaceful and caring and tender and had all those gifts and talents. But we see people stood, saw him as, as something powerful, someone who stood out from the community, someone who wasn't prepared, was prepared, sorry, to challenge people's norms. And in the story in Matthew 16, Jesus turns back to Peter and he says, well, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And Peter goes on and he says, you know what, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
And it's similar if you read John 6, 68, 69, I'm not going to read it as well, but it's, it's, it's the exact same phrasing is used in John. And it says Peter had come to believe this. He had come to believe in Jesus, that he was this, this individual, that he was who he said he was, being the bread of life, being the son of God. And I think all of us have to come to believe it. You know, at one point, we've all got to come to know Jesus and understand who he is and then make that decision over who he is to us. And I want to encourage you today, if you if you don't know him, go and study him out. Study the word. Don't don't leave it just to things you hear about who Jesus is, but go and study him out. Find out who is this Jesus we see in the Bible. We've all got to know. For me, if I share personally, many of you will know I grew up going to church. I grew up in our churches and in many ways, I saw Jesus as, yeah, he was a great guy, great teacher. I love the miracles, feeding 5,000, walking on water. I was like, wow, that would be incredible to do that, you know, or to be that or be around him. Like, always, it's always interesting with Jesus, never a dull moment. But I didn't really know him. I knew of him, but I didn't know him. I didn't know what he stood for, who he was. I hadn't made that decision for myself to, to, be, to be definitive as well until I studied the Bible. Until I got in there, until some of the brothers in the church sat down with me and, and studied him and looked at his word and looked at not just his word, but his, this consequence for me and my life. And since that time, it's, it's transformed me, guys. It's, it's changed my way of thinking. I, I've learned so much about Jesus since, but it's truly changed, changed my mind and, and it's transformed me. And, you know, nothing that I have done, just everything that I've learned through being, you know, through knowing Christ. I feel like I can have an internal, an internal satisfaction, you know, the me that was very insecure before and, and, and very prone to, to other people's opinions and things like that. It, it changed me totally. And applying his teaching has transformed my life. And so in my first point here, I want to make a plea with you and encourage you. If you're here with us today for the first time, if you don't really know much about Jesus, if you're just wanting to get to know more about this son, don't let the opportunity go. Don't let the opportunity go. Study the Bible. Ask the person who brought you here today. Look, let's sit down. Let's look more into Jesus. I want to know who the son is and who he is for me. And if you know him and if you already have that relationship with him, well, keep getting to know him. You know, every day, keep getting to know this amazing son of ours who has the word of life. Don't let the opportunity pass. There's so many different things people say about who Jesus is today. He's just, you may hear, we were reaching out yesterday. There's a lot of different opinions. Is he just a teacher? Was he an idealist? Is he just a legend in history? We've all got to decide who he is according to his word and be definitive. And once you've made that decision, okay, like I have, and maybe many of you have, to make Jesus, you know, your Lord, the one you want to follow and learn from, well, then the second thing becomes obvious and becomes clear. And the second point is this. We need to feed ourselves on his word. Feed yourself on his word. Just grab a quick drink. Because when we get to know the son and we make the decision to make him our, our Lord and our, and our savior and the one we want to we want to go after and we want to follow, we've got to feed ourselves on on his word, too. And going back to the bread that I showed you right this morning, I think this is the most health conscious generation, right, that there's ever been. I mean, in the last few years, I, I think we were talking about it here in the room. I think KFC now do some kind of, you know, alternative option, vegan I think Greg's do a, a vegan sausage roll. <laughs> I think there's there's so many different alternatives. By the way, I haven't I haven't had the vegan sausage roll, but you know I've heard it's all right. But we have so many different options. The gluten free you go to every supermarket now. You can different needs nutritionally. There's a lot of emphasis upon what you take in and and what you you consume, right? Maybe a few years ago it wasn't so so well known about okay what's the effect of eating this way and how it affects your life. But we definitely have come to understand that. What you put in affects who you become and hence the title, you know, you are what you eat. And I may divide some people by using this illustration right here. Some of you may know the end of the Premier League is today. I know Stuart might be disappointed and many disappointed, um, depending on how our teams have done, you know, this year. But for me, until, um, what, 2018, I think, I'd only ever grown up with Arsene Wenger as, as the manager of Arsenal Football Club, the team I support. That's why I said I may divide some people, but I've got to share about it, okay? And I had only known Arsene Wenger, and something critical that Arsene Wenger was, was credited for when he moved to, to England to take the position at Arsenal was 
he revolutionized the nutrition of the players. He changed the way the players ate because he believed if you eat right and you get the right stuff in, it's going to affect the way you perform. It's going to change the way you, you are on the field. And so there's a lot of funny stories out there from some of the old English players who had been around for a lot longer saying, he, he took all the fish and chips out of the, cap, out of the cafeteria. He took all the ketchup away from the, from the cafeteria, all the train in the training ground, and he changed their dietary. He had them eating at certain times before games. And basically he revolutionized them. And he said, um, it, he changed many things. And, and some of the players said, look, he actually um, extended my career by another four, five, six years because of the, the way he, he got us to eat and, and think about our bodies. And uh, it's incredible. And, and this is just one illustration of how since, well, since then, by the way, every other team has caught up. It's not like other teams are eating fish and chips in the, in the training ground, Arsenal aren't or something. Every other team now recognises the way you eat will affect the way you perform, the way you are on the field. And, and I think it's like that in life as well. Things have kind of caught up. Um, it's funny, since I put the title to You Are What You Eat a few days ago, I've been so much more thinking about what I've been eating. <laughs> so I must confess, I did have Subway yesterday. I mean, I kind of just, you know, I, I gave myself a pass. It's, you know, a bit of salad. And, yeah, anyway. So I think spiritually, it's the same. You know, what you put in will ultimately affect the way you, you perform or the way you come across or, or, what, or what really you, you, you hold on to in your life, okay? I think spiritually, it's the exact same thing. And if we're not going to the bread of life, there are many other alternatives today, I think. And I, I noted down a few and you could probably add more. I think there are, there are other alternatives to our spiritual lives to fill the desires within. I could think about it, just go after your education or your career, just become the biggest, most uh, intellectual person you can. You'll find a sense of achievement there. Um, relationships, just, just grab relationships. You know, I know many guys, perhaps even like my age and others will just go, just, just invest in relationships, get around as much as you can. And you know, you'll feel fulfillment there, just wealth out and out, get a few more zeros on your bank account and then you'll feel good, then you'll feel content. Comfort, just go all out in comfort. Just comfort yourself up as much as possible, sit back, relax and take life easy. That will fulfill you. I was even thinking about how, you know, we can feed ourselves on the news, on just the news and the media, social media that's out there and just every day, just take our, our satisfaction from that. And this is a big struggle for me, by the way. I can, I can take a lot of personal gratification from that. Like it, it, like it yeah, gratifies me and, and it gives me a sense of identity perhaps. What we consume on a daily basis will, will affect our mindset and our way of life and the way we, we sustain ourselves. What I wanna tell you this, this morning is only Jesus has the words to eternal life. Only he has the words that can fill that, that, that part in our hearts, that part in everyone's heart that's, that is designed just, just for God, right? Nothing else can fill that. There's a great scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter th uh, 3, verse 11. It says, God has set eternity in the hearts of humankind, and yet no one can fathom the mysteries. Kind of paraphrasing the second part there. You can read it. But I love that scripture. God has set eternity in everyone's hearts. Some people may choose to ignore it. They may choose to fill it with other things, but, but it's, it's true that it's there. There is, a, there is that God-shaped hole there and only Jesus' words can fill it. And so I want to plead with you this morning, fill yourself with Jesus' words. Fill yourself with his words, feed on his word, and it too will transform the way you live and it will keep you in line with God's will, God's plan, and you will see the effectiveness and the fruits of that. And I'll talk about that in a little while. But, you know, I want to share about three different brothers, a couple. Well, one of which I can see on the screen. I think the, the others are on, on other screens. I've got three now screens. Um, some, some brothers I've studied with this year that have really encouraged me in this area where they have like been feasting on God's word. They have been just eating it up and, and seeing the transformation in their life. I want to share about Mark, Paul Mark in, in Leeds. Let's go, Mark. It's been so encouraging to spend time with Leeds, uh, spend time with Leeds and Mark and with Yomi and Dan and with all the guys doing Bible studies. Mark has joined his family in being a, in becoming a disciple, I think more than a month ago now. Sorry, Mark, may, may have been, got it completely wrong. But um, Mark's a great guy, you know, and he's joining his family as a disciple and he is, he is just eating up the word. We gave him the book, Deep Convictions, right, that uh, we give to new disciples. 
And Mark's like, every day, reading it. He's doing more than one a day. He's like, I'm, Nick, I'm now on week five of like 13. And I'm just so inspired by the way Mark's been eating up that book. And of course, the word which comes with it. Let's go to Watson. Let's go, Watson. It was so good to see him yesterday out in person and sharing his, sharing his faith that he was with us. And, and Watson has this phrase, you've heard us joking about it a little bit, but it is totally genuine. Mark, um, Watson, sorry, says, you know, strong message, strong message. Every time I read a scripture, it's like, strong scripture, strong scripture. And, and it's so genuine. It's not, it's not fabricated in any way. It's because Mark, Watson sees the impact in his life. You know, he sees it's not just a, a superficial thing. It's something that meant, that's meant to change him and challenges his, challenges his thinking. And, and we so appreciate him. And so I hope this is a strong word as well for him. But it's so, so encouraging to see Watson baptized. And, you know, a couple months now, he's been our brother in Christ. And I got Gaston here on the screen with me. And I want to share about Gaston too, because Gaston feeds on the word just like those brothers do. And I'm so encouraged to, to, to know him and to have been involved in his studies as well as he's been restored. And, and what's, you know, uh, Gaston doesn't just, you know, take the word. He's like, I need to go out and preach this. People need to hear about this word. And so he goes out and like, you know, shares his faith and gives the invites and he knows it's a call to action. And I share about all these brothers and I could share about so many more as well. But I've just been so inspired by the way they eat up God's word. Keep going, brothers. And let's keep going, everyone, in feeding ourselves on God's word. I've got a few scriptures here that really encourage me and help me when it comes to feeding on God's word. Colossians 3.16 says, let the message of Christ dwell richly among you. Let the message of Christ dwell among you. So, guys, it's got to, it's got to filter into our relationships. When we feed ourselves on his word, it's going to filter into our relationships, you know, between us. And that's going to encourage us and, and, and help our hearts. Psalm 1, uh, I think me and James talk about this scripture sometimes. Be, be like a tree planted, you know, by the streams of living water is the one who meditates on God's perfect law. Day, no, day and night, all the time, meditate on his word and you will be like a tree planted by streams of living water, always sustained and always allowed to be prosperous. Mm -hmm. Matthew 7, 24, 27, Jesus says, build your house on my word, which is the rock. And you, you know, your house will be, will be solid. It will stand the test of time. It will stand up to all the, the challenges of life. Build your house on his word. And there's so many more. I think of Second Timothy, you know, 3, 16, 17. We read it with the teens a couple of nights ago. You know, let the word be something that can, you know, corrects and, and teaches and trains and rebukes at times. We need to have the word in our hearts. Feed yourself on his word. Now, I'm going to use, uh, I think, hopefully, Stuart, you, you appreciate this one. It's another little cliche. We're going to have to go against the grain sometimes. To go against the grain. We talk about bread. Sometimes we're going to have to, it's going to be challenging. Sometimes, you know, feeding yourself and his word is going to be different, right? So I looked up the definition of the urban, urban definition of go against the grain. And it means you go against something that's, that's it's, it's not easy. It challenges your way of thinking. It's, it's a hard thing sometimes. And so if you look in John 6, verse 60, it says that some, some of the people were actually struggling with what Jesus was saying right here. I'm going to read it to you. It says, on hearing it, his teaching, Many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Look at the followers that Jesus had. He had many followers. We don't, it doesn't tell us exactly how many, but it says that uh, people were struggling. Some struggled. It, wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't something they didn't understand. They understood it. It was just hard. And so, brothers and sisters, we've got to be prepared to go against the grain sometimes. We've got to, we can't be afraid to follow Christ. It's not easy, but it's something that is fruitful. And, and just as just as like when Arsene Wenger came in and it was didn't seem all, you know, it wasn't all round accepted in the time he arrived in 96 to do a new thing. There's a lot of challenges. It, it will be challenging for us too. We've got to be uh, committed and keep going, following Christ, even when in a world where, where there's a lot of pursuits of other things to fulfill those desires. We've got to stay true, be prepared to go against the grain. And we see some of the disciples struggling to do that. But if you look down, Peter's like, you know what, Jesus, you've got the words of life. There's no one else I'm going to. You have the eternal words. And Peter and, and the other 12 that stay with him, look at the impact. 
they've had because they stayed true, because they stayed strong, because they kept following Jesus. We are the fruits of their labors. We are the fruits of their work in many ways that we are here today. Guys, we can be just as impactful and have just an inspiring message if we just stay true, just stay strong, just keep feeding yourself every day by the power of Christ. Jesus promises to sustain us. He will remain with us. Don't be afraid to be seen following Christ and proclaiming him. It, they, they had the challenges too. It wasn't just us today in our time. They too faced those things, but they stayed true and look at the powerful amazing message they had and look at the life-changing conversations and you know challenges they were able to go through and we are in many ways a result of that i hope you're with me church on these things be fed by his word every day you know keep going and, and of course if, if you're guest with us here today get to know this christ and find out his word so you can start to apply it and see the transformation it can have on your life i've got one more point for you and then we'll take we'll go into communion and so you need to know who christ is you want to feed yourself on his word. And then the effect of that is going to be my third point. Fed to be fruitful. Fed to be fruitful. We're talking a little bit about food, right? As we close up the sermon here today on John chapter six. And uh, in John chapter four, the disciples have gone to buy some bread, physical bread, um, to sustain them after some journey. And they come back to Jesus and they find he, uh, they find he hasn't had any food. And uh, all that he's talking about, I have my bread <laughs> already. And they're like, Jesus, we don't see any bread here. What, what, what are you talking about? And in John chapter 4, 30, uh, 34, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That was Jesus' food. That was what he ate. He ate up God's will. Of course, we know Jesus, Jesus ate physically, but spiritually to do God's will was what sustained him. There's a great scripture in Mark 1, 35 that many of us will know. It says very early in the morning, Jesus got up, went to a solitary uh, place where he prayed and he spent time with God. And then coming down off that time, the disciples find him and they're like, Jesus, there's so much going on. Where have you been? We've got so much to take to and do with you today. And he's like, no, I've come to preach. I've come to, to preach to the towns about the kingdom. And I love that. Jesus spent his time in prayer, focusing on God, sustaining himself, filling himself. I don't always think if Jesus needed to go and do this, how much more do I need to do it <laughs> every day? If the son of man needed to go and spend time with God in the morning just to be ready for the next that day, how much more do I need to be spending time feasting on God's word and, and in meditation and prayer to get myself focused? Jesus was sustained by his father's will. You know, as we read our Bibles every morning and we spend time there and hopefully this, this lesson is helping you to, to gain those convictions on doing that and, and, and praying in the morning. It's going to help us to connect with Christ's will, which was ultimately to do his, his father's will. We're going we're gonna to be fed with his, his purposes, fed with his plan. And so I've heard it said just as we kind of wrap up and get towards the end here that, you know, I'm this, this is a quote, by the way, it's not talk about me necessarily but i am just one beggar helping another beggar to find bread right we're, we're, we're just individuals that have have nothing that are undeserving that are flawed in many ways i have many weaknesses in my life but i found the bread of life and all i'm trying to do now is trying to show other people and that's exactly what jesus that's exactly what his purpose was of course he wasn't a beggar and jesus was perfect but all he was doing was showing people where they could find bread. And so I'm so inspired by hearing about things like yesterday, being out, reaching out um, in St. Peter's Square. And um, some of you on the WhatsApp groups will also have seen other groups. I think there was a group just down the road in Clifton meeting. I think it was Pete and Sue and their family group um, spending time together and sharing their faith. And there are other groups that I know are doing things even this week to share as we come out of lockdown let's go out and let's let's just go and proclaim christ let's go out and carry out his will it's not about us it never has been it's only christ working through us it's not about our ability we're just proclaiming christ to the nations we're, we're trying to help people to feed on his word to find that eternal bread let's not let's not just hold on to the word it was never meant to be just held on to like stored 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 stored, stored. no it's got to be passed on you know it's got to be obeyed right we eat and then we go out and we are, we are fruitful. 
as we get towards the end here, uh, there's a song we sing normally um, at church, which I was, we're going to listen to at the end of service today. It's Here Am I, Send Me by J. Brian Craig, mm -hmm. right? Some of you may know. Here's, here's one of the lyrics, one of the verses. It says, I'm not going to sing it, by the way. So you're just going to have to hear me say it. So maybe I, get, maybe I get Isaiah to do it. You know, he's got a better voice than me. There are hungering souls who cry aloud for bread. With the bread of life, they're longing to be fed. Shall they starve and famish while a feast is free? I must be more faithful. Here am I, send me. I love that verse. I think it so well depicts the, the hearts, you know, that Jesus had to bring the bread of life to, to the people around him. And, and we too have been, have, are going to be fed to be fruitful, to go out and pro to proclaim that there is that free feast ready for anyone who would, who would accept it and hear it. And, and this isn't just for us. It's free. It's for everyone now. Everyone's got that chance. All we need to do is just be faithful, go out and be, be sent, be used by God. And we will all do so in our, in our different ways, mm -hmm. together or in, as individuals, as partnerships. I'm so inspired by what God has been doing, what he will do. You know, see all the new faces being baptized and restored and people studying the Bible and, mm -hmm. and church. We're going we're gonna to see more greater things. Jesus said, you're going you're gonna to do greater things than even me. Mm -hmm. Do you still believe that? That we're going to do greater things, that there are greater things in store if we're just faithful enough to go to bring his word it's not about us it's just about god's word and so as we wrap up and get towards communion the three points simply are today who is jesus to you you've got to decide who he is and then when, we, when we've made that decision we've got to we've got to get behind it and feed ourselves on his word on a daily basis let's let's channel the word let's let's take it in let's let's eat it up like those brothers i mentioned and go for it you know, and live the life Jesus has called us to live. And then when we, when we feed ourselves on it, let's go and proclaim that we have that bread of life, that we can show people that bread of life, that we can give them something that they don't have right now or that they desperately need. There's a lot of desperation out there. People need the bread of life. They need that eternal contentment and satisfaction that only Jesus can bring. And I know God will do incredible things through us. As we get ready to take up communion, I just want to read uh, quickly John chapter 6. Because there's a, there's a scripture here that is very good for communion. Uh, John 6, Jesus has been talking about bread. And uh, down in 53, he says, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the, of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them, just as the Father sent me. And I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. We'll stop there. It's, this is an interesting, you know, phrase. I think about what was Jesus talking about? Jesus, are you saying we need to eat your, eat your flesh and drink your blood? It sounds a bit, you know, kind of sounds a bit interesting. But of course, Jesus is talking about the spiritual, you know, to, to, to feast on him. And when we look at the communion and what he, he would do for everyone on the cross, ultimately why he came, it is that we can feast on, in, feast on him. We can consume him and he, and he purifies us and he, he cleanses us from our sin. He provides, as I said at the start, that sin-free bread. This wasn't the most perfect way of saying it either. I mean, it must have sounded quite strange to them. But by the end and the fruition of all things, it, it became much, much clearer what he was talking about. And so... You know, we, we're going to take up the bread and the wine in just a few minutes after I pray. And uh, this bread and this wine symbolizes what, you know, all we've been talking about today, feeding, knowing him and feeding on his word and being fruitful. It just wouldn't be possible if we didn't have a, that son go to the cross, take up our sin and, and destroy it through no ability of our own. We couldn't do it. He took it. He took on our sin so that we can have this second chance so that we can go and put our hope in that eternal promise of heaven and also share about that eternal promise and feast uh, that I was sharing about yeah, with the song to all the other people out there in this world. So let's take this time just to pray and we'll, uh, we'll take up the bread and the wine before, and we'll have a communion uh, worship song as well. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, thank you so much for today. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look at John chapter six a little bit, God. Thank you for your son, Father, for just coming to 
be that eternal bread, Lord, to be that uh, perfect sacrifice, that sacrificial lamb that came down to not only share, you share your word and share your heart with us, Lord, but to also go to the cross, Lord, to be prepared to take on himself the sins of mankind and, and destroy it for eternity, Lord, so that we could all, all of us uh, come back to you, God, have that close connection and fellowship with you and, and have that promise of eternal life, God. We pray that as we take up this bread and take this wine, uh, God, you will uh, allow us to meditate on our lives and God, just, just reaffirm our commitment to you, Lord, every day. And uh, God, we pray all this in your son's mighty name. Amen. Amen.